Uh, before we get underway, I just want to thank a number of our sponsors. Uh, our friends from the Trobe University who are here tonight have been wonderful partners of, uh, of the Sports Writers Festival since its inception. I know we've got some people from cyclingtips.com uh, in, uh, in the room tonight. Thank you to you as well for, for being part of what we believe is going to be uh, a growing institution in this town. We think we've established the idea of the Sports Writers Festival in the last two years and it's only going to get bigger and bigger. Also our friends at 1116 SEN, the station I work on, thank you for all the support. We couldn't have uh, promoted the event without the radio support that we've had. And the Raw as well, uh, theraw.com.au, fantastic uh, sports writing website where you hear the real voice of sports fans uh, day in, day out about a whole raft of sports. And not forgetting the Green and Gold Army, who uh, my partner Michael Edgley, who is one of the people who's helped put this together, uh, I've been lucky enough to travel the world with him on numerous occasions, taking uh, Socceroos fans to the World Cup, and it is uh, a life-changing experience if you get to go on one of those tours. But I do want to read something before I invite David to the stage from Jamie Fuller, the chairman of Skins, one of our principal partners and sponsors of this event, somebody David knows very well himself and has dealt with over the years. <laughs> Jamie's support and his company support has certainly been a cornerstone of what we've uh, been able to do to get you here tonight. He would, would have been here, uh, as you probably know, David, was meant to be here in October. Jamie was going to be here for this event to introduce him, but because uh, of uh, circumstance, uh, he's had to re go back to work in, in Europe and he asked me to read part of this to you. He said, I'm proud to be sponsoring this session at the Sports Writers Festival, Lance and me, to, and uh, the appearance of David Walsh. Uh, for those of you who don't know my company, Skins, we're a company born in Australia, headquartered in Switzerland. We operate in the UK, USA, Japan and the Netherlands with global distribution and we pioneered compression wear for sports people. Uh, I got into Skins because of my passion for sport. Uh, it's a passion that has driven my life. I was never ever going to be a professional sports person, so I turned what I could uh, to do well, and that is business, and made sports-related business a success. These are two key aspects of my love of sport. First, it's intergenerational. It's something that you can share with your parents and the people you love. And second, because of that, it has the power to change society for the good. All the good values that we associate with sport are also important to how we live our lives as individuals, as families, as communities, and as nations. The values of fair play, integrity, discipline, commitment, and teamwork, doing the best you can possibly do and being the best you can possibly be on a level playing field and the true spirit of competition. These are the values that Skins as a brand likes to believe that it uh, exhibits. However, the more that I got to know and work in sport, the more horrified I became at, at what sport had become. Corruption, doping, match fixing, <coughs> racism, people trapping, uh, trafficking, homophobia, they stem from the same problem, how sport is run. So he got very much involved in anti the anti-doping movement and also uh, involved in a uh, uh, fair play movement for FIFA and uh, human rights organisations that are working very hard to make sure that the uh, World Cup in Qatar is one not built on the back of slavery. Uh, he does say that David is one of the people that he's most proud to be associated with because of his uh, commitment to those very same values and uh, that his commitment to that is something that has moved the needle uh, very far in trying to make sure the sport that he loves, cycling, is one that is clean and on that fair playing field that we all hope that all the sport that we love will be able to compete on. Can you make him welcome to the stage, the man who wrote Seven Deadly Sins and LA Confidential. <laughs> this conversation with me, David Walsh. Firstly, how have you been enjoying Melbourne? Yeah, very much. Um, still a bit jet lagged if I sound a bit more stupid than I would normally sound. Um, it's probably to do with the fact that I don't know whether it's evening or morning. Um, but no, I, I've always, I mean, I've been coming to Australia since my first time to come was uh, 1987 Rugby World Cup, and, which was the first, and I've been coming at regular intervals ever since. And I, I must say, I, there's, I've never come and not enjoyed Australia. And, and I say this now when I'm at home all the time, whenever Australia comes up, at the time I wrote Seven Deadly Sins, I, I, I would have accepted if the book sold about 20,000. Because Armstrong went down on the 22nd of October, if you were going to, let's be honest, everyone wants to, if you bring out a book, you bring it out when people are ready to buy books. People are ready to buy books around Christmas, presents, all that stuff. The publishers came along with the idea and they said, they said, can you do it in about four weeks? And I thought, that's a, that's a little bit, it's a little bit soon, but at the same time, we wouldn't be in the shops before Christmas. The books got in the shops um, on the 13th of December, which is 12 days before Christmas, which is about 10 days of shopping. And um, if you'd said to me, how much would it sell? I would have said 20,000. If it sells 30,000, I'd be chuffed. 
And I was thinking, worldwide, 30,000, I'd be chuffed. That Christmas, it sold 30,000 copies in Australia. And I was completely staggered. I mean, for Australians, I don't exist. Now, Lance Armstrong does. But why would Australians have bought that book in those numbers? I mean, the people in, in Simon & Schuster in, in Sydney and Melbourne were just flummoxed by it. They, they believed in it, they put it in the shops, but they couldn't believe the reaction. And part of the reason I'm here is to say thank you to every single Australian because I never thought I would ever have any, I've never had money in my life. I mean, we, we have seven kids, so how could you have money? <laughs> um, but Australia has done its bit, I can tell you. <laughs> I, I want to start with the latest news uh, before we go back and, and look at the story. Uh, Lance Armstrong's been in court this week, in fact, uh, uh, in this court case uh, defending an action brought by Floyd Landis and the US authorities in relation to sponsorship money in US Postal. What do you know about that and, and how crucial is that to, to Armstrong's future? It's absolutely central to his future because this is a case that Floyd Landis initiated way back, I think in 2010, under the, what Americans call the False Claims Act. It's qui tam. It's like the whistleblower suit. In other words, you live in a town in the US. You realize your neighbor has been conducting a business in his garage and that he's been doing it without telling anybody and that you know he's not paying any tax on it. And you go to the authorities and you say, my mate across the road, he's got a business and he's not telling you about it. They investigate him, they realize this is true, and this guy then has to pay back 400,000 in unpaid tax. Because if you defraud the American exchequer of $1, the fine is $3. And the guy who did the whistleblowing, the, the neighbor who, who across the road, he gets a third of whatever the fine is. So the bitter irony of this is that Floyd Landis could actually come out financially ahead Floyd of Landis could conceivably be paid $30 million as his part. If Armstrong gets the full fine, because what happened was US Postal sponsored Lance Armstrong's team. Lance Armstrong was part owner of the team. He still has quite a bit of money. Um, Floyd Landis said, we defrauded the government out of that money. That's my claim. You know, I'm saying that we, the team, Lance Armstrong and all the owners of the team, got that money from US Postal under false pretenses. In other words, we signed a contract, which they did, saying we don't dope, and we doped up to our gills. So they got about 33 million, 32, 33 million. Now, if, if, if the courts decide that money was gained illegally, you multiply that figure by three, which is about 100 million, and that's the fine that Lance Armstrong could get. Now, he wouldn't have to pay it all, but he would have to pay quite a lot of it, and he would certainly have to give up whatever wealth he has. So he's looking at complete financial ruin. If it ends up like that, I believe that it's still very much in the balance, because Armstrong's argument is US Postal got their money's worth. They can't be coming along now and, and claiming they want it all back. And I have a certain amount of sympathy for that. I mean, US Postal said, you signed a contract saying you didn't dope. We believed you. And Armstrong said, come on. Armstrong is now saying, well, you must have known. <laughs> and It's a perverse morality, isn't it? Yeah, but I can kind of understand it because US Postal didn't want to know. I mean, forgive me for kind of referring back to myself on this, but... I brought out books and, I've, and, and I had done you know, lots of research, I'd written lots of stories. Nobody at US Postal was ringing up David Walsh and saying, hold on, you know, David, tell us, what do you know? Because we're committing lots of tens of millions of dollars to this team, give us all your information. They, they didn't want to know. I mean, I've used an expression at different times, the irresponsibility of not knowing, and that's what US Postal had, they were being, basically wanting to look the other way when people were accusing Lance Armstrong of doping. More recently for you, Bradley Wiggins. I mean, Wiggins, uh, he rode recently in London, a six-day event. He said he, at the end of that, almost in an Armstrong fashion, said he's considering a comeback in 2017. Would you be surprised if he did? Yeah, I'd be staggered, and I don't believe it will happen. Um, but it could, because I'm sure... Um, he's kind of disenchanted with all that's happened, but basically in my eyes, Wiggins is now tarnished. Um, the, he got these therapeutic use exemptions to use a banned product in 2011, 2012, and 2013 with Team Sky. 
a team that had set itself up on the basis of we're cleaner than clean. And people who supported them bought into them on that basis. And it turns out that Dave Bresford, the boss, went with this thing of giving Wiggins a banned product to treat his asthma. But the banned product was incredibly powerful as a performance enhancer and they gave it to him just before the Tour de France. Their argument is, well, that's when the pollen allergies kick in. But then in 2013, when he, was, when he wasn't riding the Tour de France, he was riding the Tour of Italy, they gave it to him on the 22nd of April, when the pollen allergies don't kick in. And to me, it just stinks. And my feeling about Team Sky is they're now a damaged, damaged goods. Do you feel in any way um embarrassed or, or regretful that you're embedded with them, that you, that you went and spent time with Team Sky in 2013 and wrote a book about them. And, and, and you know, given that your reputation was for, for being you know, scrupulous with, with, with uh, keeping a distance from, from teams because you want to have that critical distance, was, was that something you regret doing? It, it, it is a good question, and I'm conflicted on it. Um, see, it's fine to say now I should have... Um, I should have just said no. When they offered me the opportunity to go, to, Dave Brailsford came along and said, look, you've done all this work on Armstrong. We're now the best team out there. We've just won the Tour de France in 2012 with Bradley Wiggins. We have nothing to hide. And to prove that to you, we'd like you to come and live in the team. And I said, and I'll have access to everything. I can talk to everybody. I mean, very good Alaskan writer, Daniel Coyle, went with the Lance Armstrong team in 2005, his last year in the Tour de France. But they said to Daniel Coyle, you can't speak to Michele Ferrari about doping. Now, Dave Brailsford was offering me a chance to come into Team Sky, no bars. I could speak to anybody, I could go anywhere, everything would be accessible. And I thought, yeah, I'll go with that. Now I could say, oh, they were giving Wiggins, they'd given Wiggins a TUE in 2011, 2012 and 2013. And if I'd known about those TUEs, I, 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 I'm absolutely certain I would not have got in the team. I would not have accepted. But I didn't know about them. And people might say, well, why didn't you ask Brailsford? Did he give Bradley Wiggins a TUE before the 2012 Tour de France? Well, you know, you would ask that question if you'd been given some tip off that that had existed. But it wasn't a question I was ever going to ask because I just didn't think that was even on the, on the radar as a possibility. So I don't really re regret it because I, I did get an insight. What I wrote, I think, mostly, um, like everything I wrote, I wrote honestly. I wrote, I mean, I'd been in the team for about seven months. Chris Froome won the Tour de France. And, I, and that was the point at which I made a judgment. And the headline on the Sunday Times piece said, why I believe in Chris Froome. And I did believe in Chris Froome. Do you Froome. still believe in Chris Froome? Yes, I do. I totally believe he's won the Tour de France three times clean. And people say, but, but, but look at Wiggins. Separate person, separate situation. Different characters. Diff very different characters. And I believe that Team Sky, in a general sense, is a very clean team. But what they did with Wiggins, I mean, nobody else will say this because people pussyfoot around it. People say it was unethical or, I mean, all the journalists will say, well, we're not saying they did, they did anything illegal because it was within the laws of the sport. It may be, maybe it's questionable. i will go further than that. To me, it was dirty what they did. Uh, they gave Wiggins TUEs that I don't believe his medical situation merited. And I think they gave it to him as a kind of a reinsurance or an insurance just to, just to give him a better chance to compete better in the Tour de France. I want to take you right back, before we start talking about your first encounter with Armstrong, to your love of cycling and, and where it came from, because you write about it in, in Seven Deadly Sins. It was a, as a rider by the name of Sean Kelly, who you, 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 you know, well, I guess you idolised or you loved a, as a younger yeah. man. But you also discovered something about him along the way that was probably the first window that you had on the realities of professional cycling in the late 80s or in the 80s, and which led to, as we know, what was revealed later on. Yeah. I mean, as a, I'm always, as a prelude to that, <coughs> This sounds ridiculous when I say it, but the only thing it's got in its favor is it, it's true. I wanted to be a sports writer from the age of six. And you can say, how could anybody know what they wanted to be when they're six? Honestly, I did. And I never varied. My mother wanted me to be a teacher. And I said, no, I want to be a sports writer. Because I loved the act of writing and I love sport. 
and I just put the two together from the moment I could think, all I wanted to be. And first job I got was in, uh, after going through university, I got a job in small provincial newspaper in Ireland. And then in 1980, I got a job in a national newspaper as a sports writer, which was the ultimate dream. And at the time, there was a cyclist who lived 16 miles from where I lived. And you know the way you have an affinity to somebody who comes from your part of the country? And this guy was the, about the best cyclist in the world in one day races, for sure, Sean Kelly. And he was rising, he would, in 1984, he would become world number one. And I felt outraged that he wasn't getting any coverage in Ireland. And I, I had no interest in cycling. I never cycled in my life. But I could see this guy was winning a stage of the Tour de France, and we'd look at our Irish newspapers, and he would get two paragraphs. Yesterday, Sean Kelly won the stage into Ton and Le Bas. He beat such and such a guy in the sprint, and it means that Kelly moves from 46th in the overall classification to 38th. End of story. So Irish guy wins a stage in the Tour de France, and nobody knows about it. And, uh, and I decided this was my first journalistic crusade. I was going to introduce the Irish public to this fantastic man, Sean Kelly. I mean, to tell you how bad I got that disease, I, I, I said to my wife in middle of 1983, I said, how would you feel about my giving up my job in the Irish press, the newspaper I worked for at the time, and we go to live in Paris? And she said, well, why would we go to Paris? You know, and I said, um, now at this time we had two young kids, both under the age of two, and I said, um, because I want to follow the Tour de France and I want to you know, write a book about Sean Kelly, this Irish <laughs> cyclist. And she said, yeah, I'm on for that. And we went, to, we went to Paris, lived there for a year. Two children became three. Our third born, Simon, was born in Paris. And I wrote the book on Kelly. And you're absolutely right when you say something happened then. And I'm not claiming to be any kind of journalistic paragon because one morning um, I went off to cover a race called Paris-Brussels. And I was with a friend of mine, Paul Kimmage. And we, we, he, Kimmage was staying in the house with me because he was an amateur cyclist and we took him in because his brother had gone home and he was left on his own. And he came and he lived with us for about three months. And um, we went out to the start of this race. I was covering it. He was just coming as a fan. And we went to see Kelly sitting. He was sitting like the boot of the car was open and Kelly was just sitting, sitting in the boot, feet on the ground. His bike was there and we're chatting. And we thought it was just unbelievable to get chatting to this guy for about a half an hour. And, um, and then it came, the, the whistle sounded for him to get to the start. And he got up on his bike and Kelly had a way of checking the tire pressure in his rear wheels. And he would do that by, he would catch the saddle in the cheeks of his backside and he would kind of jump up and down like that in the saddle to check the pressure. And as he jumped up and down, Kimmage and I heard the sound of pills rattling in a plastic container. And it was like the most awful sound you could imagine for two kind of cycling kind of, you know, fans. Because even though I was a journalist, I was primarily a fan of Sean Kelly's. And it's a funny thing, the sound of pills hitting that plastic, it's a completely distinct sound in that... It, it couldn't can, have been anything else. It couldn't have been anything else. We both, I looked at Kimmage, a look that said, did you hear that? And he looked at me and said, yeah, I heard it. And I never wrote about that. I never wrote a line about that. I, I was writing a biography of the, of the guy. So I, it wasn't his book. It was my book on him. It wasn't an autobiography. And I should have put that in the book. And if I was a proper journalist, I would have asked him about it. What were the pills? Because that day, he tested positive. His first positive test. And I never mentioned those pills until I was writing Seven Deadly Sins, which was the point at which I was getting everything off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in between times, you did, and this, I think it's instructive of what was to come, you did get a chance to make that decision again with someone that most of us will remember here, Michelle Smith, who yeah. emerged in the 1996 Olympic Games in the pool out of nowhere yeah. as the Irish superfish. And um, it was quite clear, I think most Australians, as you know, David, we've talked about this, uh, rather strangely keen on, on uh, swimming at the Olympic yeah. Games. So we kind of knew that that was odd. But in Ireland, she was being celebrated as, 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 the, uh, as the, new mo the reigning monarch of, of Dublin, wasn't she? Totally, yeah. I mean, if you consider that the Olympics have been going, I think, the modern Olympics since 1896. 1896 to, uh, this was 19... 96, Atlanta, was 96. 100 years of Olympic Games, Ireland as a country won four gold medals in 100 years. 
and then in one week, it won another three, <laughs> right? In a sport, swimming, right? <laughs> Previously, in all the times we were swimming, in all the times we were swimming, uh, we had swimmers going to the Olympics. We regarded it in Ireland as a result if they didn't drown. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, I told, I told Francis a story, and it, this is... A this is my favourite sports story ever now. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a diversion back to Montreal 1976. Montreal 1976. I had two friends who covered those games. Uh, Tom O'Riordan and uh, Jimmy Meegan. And they were working for two evening newspapers in Dublin. And they had to make a decision whether they were going to go to the swimming venue for the heats of the 1500 metres. <clears throat> because there was an Irish guy in it called Kevin Williamson. Will we go? Will, because we'll be able to pick up the result at the press centre <clears throat> and we don't have to go. Uh, and eventually their conscience got the better of them and they went. And they missed the start of the race. And, but they only missed about, they'd only gone about two lengths of the 1500 metres or maybe three lengths. But already Kevin Williamson was half a length behind the second last swimmer, right? And they thought, oh God, this is going to be terrible. But they were really going there to get quotes from him afterwards because they knew he wasn't going to qualify because Irish swimmers never qualified for next round. So Kevin Williamson in the end finished over a length behind the second last swimmer. So if you're an Irish journalist, what you did was you know, don't just blame him because competition is really stiff at the Olympics. Just check on his personal best and see that he at least get near his personal best or beat his personal best. And Kevin Williamson was eight seconds outside his personal best, which was very disappointing. Even if you were trying to be kind, this was, <laughs> this was a difficult one to kind of square. So the journalists went to him and they said, oh, Kevin, tough luck, you know, how did, it, how did you feel? Oh, he said, I wasn't at my best. I, I just don't know, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't get anywhere near my personal best. So that's really disappointing. And they said, any reason why you've kind of underperformed? And he said, oh, I know, I know. And they said, well, what happened? And he said, I eat too big a breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is totally what he said. And that was us at swimming. And we go then to Atlanta. And in seven days, we win three gold medals with a woman who'd been an international swimmer for 12 years and had never got near a final. And the Irish nation are thinking, this is the most brilliant thing they've ever seen. <laughs> she was articulate. Um, she was quite nice looking in a way. She, <laughs> she gave, um, she gave her post-match or post-swim interviews in in English and in Gaelic, oh, which like about charm offensive. one percent or less than one. I don't know what the percentage is. Let I mean a, a fraction of one percent of the Irish population could do an interview in Gaelic, and she could. I mean, she was a dream if she was clean. And she was a complete nightmare if she wasn't. And she wasn't. And there was like three journalists who decided, sorry, I'm not buying this. Uh, Paul Kimmage, Tom Humphreys were the other two, and I was the third. And I was really pleased. But that was a really difficult one because my kids were going out, meeting their friends. And when I got back from the Olympics, I got lots of from the kids. Oh, Dad, you know, my friend said their parents are really disappointed in you, what you've written about Michelle Smith. And that was a real difficult one because the Irish nation fell in love with her. I mean, 50% of the population were getting up at two o'clock in the morning to watch swimming, a sport they had never watched in their lives. 50% is a lot of people to watch swimming. But it's interesting because I think the reason why I bring that up is that what that is to me is what I call a narcotic narrative. It's something that the, the community or the population or the, or the want to hear. They want to believe that Michelle Smith is a champion. They wanted to believe Lance Armstrong is a champion because yes. it serves their needs as much as anything else. And so for someone to, uh, you know, to, to upset that party and say, well, hang on a sec, you, you can have your dream, but the reality is that they're a cheat. Uh, you know, you're, you're messing with their fix and they don't want that. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, William Butler Yeats, the poet, had a line about this, you know, and it's so true. Um, that love poem where there's a line in it which says, tread softly because you tread on my dreams. And the Irish nation would have been saying to us, the guys who are writing badly of Michelle Smith, tread softly because you're treading on our dreams. And we were treading on their dreams. They thought this was the most beautiful thing, the underdog Irish girl beating you know, the tall, even better looking American uh, uh, swimmers who were the big swimmers that Michelle Smith was beating. And um, 
it was, yeah, it was a very difficult to stomach story for the, for the Irish um, population. It was like they were having this fantastic parade and we were peeing all over it. Um, but in the end, you were vindicated, as you were with Lance. So uh, that must have given you a lot of satisfaction, or how did you feel about it after that? Well, the legacy of that was that writing about Armstrong was very easy after you'd written about Michelle Smith, because Armstrong wasn't Irish, and Irish people hadn't kind of invested in, the, in him <laughs> in the way they'd invested in Michelle Smith. Um, but it also meant that, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, uh, I remember somebody once saying, it doesn't matter who does a good performance, you have to applaud it, even if it's your enemy, even if it's the star you don't like. If he does something that truly is worthy, you've got to acknowledge it as worthy. And my argument would be that, well, if you accept that, you equally have to accept that if you see something that doesn't look right to you, that doesn't actually make you emotionally on their side, you're thinking, this doesn't seem right. Well, you have to say you don't think it seems right. You know, if you think it's wrong, you've got to stand up for, for that point of view. Tell us about your first encounter with Lance Armstrong, because you couldn't have known when you met him that your lives would become so intertwined. Or did you have some sense of that at the time? No, no sense of it, really. I mean, um, after I'd gone on my Sean Kelly crusade, I did fall in love with cycling a bit, and I especially fell in love with the Tour de France. <clears throat> I think anybody who's ever been on it can get hooked on the Tour. It's a... It's a kind of a strange cultural thing to go around France for three weeks, three and a half weeks, even like by the time you, you actually join up the race and leave, it's actually four weeks because you, you go there on Tuesday and you, co you come back the Monday after the race. So it's four weeks. And it's like this pilgrimage around France. And I'd done it since 19, well, 82 was my first. I was there for two weeks of 83 and then for the next 10 for the entire tours. So it had been going on for over 10 years, and I got this thing where I, I wanted to write a book about the tour. And I had this really grandiose notion that I was going to be like some latter-day Geoffrey Chaucer writing the Canterbury Tales, <laughs> you know, where you, you know, Canterbury Tales was the pilgrimage, a religious pilgrimage that went on, and, and Chaucer had all these people tell stories, you know, on the route. And I thought, well, the Tour de France is a pilgrimage. I'll interview 13 people on the way. They'll tell me their stories. I'll put their stories together and we'll have the story of the Tour de France. And I wanted the first chapter to be about some kid riding the race for the first time. This was 1993. I looked up the, the neophytes riding the race and Armstrong's name stood out. He was 21, the youngest rider in the race. He spoke great English as a Texan and, and that was a big factor for me. Uh, and he had a good record as an amateur. So I picked him out, asked him would he do the interview. Yes, he would. I met him on the first rest day in a lovely hotel outside Grenoble, and we spoke for over three hours, and I loved the guy. Just really thought, you know, this is somebody you're going to be, is going to make a real impression. But I would have said that was wholly positive. <clears throat> but the thing about Lance is that he does have a hell of a lot of charisma. If you were sitting here and you were kind of asking him questions he wanted to be asked and you were being relatively okay with him, I guarantee you he could charm you, he could mesmerize you. He really had and has still got a very kind of a, can be very charismatic. And that's how I found him. And I felt like, you know, pathetic sports writer really who, who thought this is a guy the world are going to hear about. And when he gets close to the top, I'm going to be saying, you know, when Lance was in his first tour, I interviewed him for three and a half hours. Kind of knew him before anybody knew him. I mean, I know, pathetic, but that's how sports writers are. That's what we like to say. You know, we're the guy who stood beside the champion. And, um, and I came away from that thinking, we're going to hear about this guy. And we were, but in different circumstances, because he got sick, uh, as we know, prior to that time, he was a, he was a modest cyclist in, in the peloton. He wasn't a superstar. He was a, I, I, I know, I would disagree, Francis. I think he was, a, he was an excellent one-day racer, and he could have been one of the best. I mean, at that time, he was one of the best in the world as a one-day guy, but he never really climbed the high mountains. He wasn't really a time trialist, so therefore, you couldn't consider him for the tour. He'd ridden it four times, best place 36th, 
I mean, in every mountain stage, the closest he ever got to the winner on a mountain stage was eight minutes behind. And mostly he was 20 minutes behind, 26 minutes behind, just one of the guys who could never compete in the tour. So then when he comes back after cancer and he's completely transformed, my argument would be you'd need to be completely blind not to see that something has happened here, something that needs to be explained. So 1999, after the, uh, the disgrace of the Festina, revelations of 1998, when uh, the Spanish authorities finally put the clamps on, uh, on Festina and uh, there was those extraordinary scenes, you might remember them, of cyclists getting off their bikes and protesting yeah. yep. as if there was some sort of uh, outrage being inflicted upon them. They yes. couldn't just continue their circus they wanted to. They called it the Tour of Renewal in 1999. Yeah. And Lance Armstrong was central to all that. But you write about it in the book, about one of those fork-in-the-road moments that, that writers and journalists have. There was a particular stage in a particular climb where you were in the room with a bunch of journalists and Lance took off up the hill like he'd never done before and there was a collective intake of breath within the, the, uh, the travelling pack. There was even laughter and derision of those cynic, cynical enough to understand what was going on. But at that moment, the people in that room had to choose what side of the fence they were going to be on. Yes, yeah. So where were you that day, was it? Yeah, it was in the press room, and it was the, it was the first mountain stage to Sestriere, and there was leaders up the road, and then Lance took off, and he overtook them. And he just went past them. I remember Richard Veronk was speaking. He was the top like, climber at the time, a complete doper with the Festina team. And he said Lance passed him like Lance was on a motorbike. And that's how it looked. And, you know, I remember his lips were pursed, I mean, there was no, his, his mouth wasn't open gasping for oxygen or anything like that. He just went up that mountain like turbocharged. And we're in the press room and a lot of the journalists were looking and pointing and kind of, you know, nodding their heads, you know, yeah. bloody hell. How could you believe that? That was their expression. And I think there was a significant amount of journalists who felt that. And if you read Le Keep, the French newspaper that covered the race, you know, seven or eight pages every day, they were completely disbelieving. They did not believe in Lance Armstrong. Lots of people didn't. But by the time the race ended, which was like another two weeks later, lots of people had changed their view because it was such a good story. And, um, and if I could uh, in, indulge myself a little bit here, because there's an important point that, that I would make in relation to why I reacted the way I did. I come to that 99 tour as quite a different person. I mean, Francis said about the Festina scandal. That opened our eyes. We've talked about that. But um, Michelle Smith was another big factor in how I saw things. Um, but there was a, th a year before Michelle Smith kind of happened in Atlanta. Our eldest, our eldest boy, John, who was 12 years of age, died in an accident. He was struck by a car while coming home from a football match on his bicycle. And he was killed instantly. And, and as a family, we decided that what we wanted to do, because we had five other kids, was always talk about John. Never was he going to be some skeleton that we were afraid to take out of a cupboard. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to speak to everybody I could who could tell me little things about John. And the most interesting story I heard was from a, a woman called Breda Toomey, who had been John's teacher when he was in year... I think it was about fourth class or fifth class, which would have been meant that he was either nine or ten years of age. And Mrs. Toomey had been reading the story, she told me, of the nativity three weeks before Christmas. You know, Mary and Joseph, they come from Galilee, they go to Bethlehem, they're turned away from all the inns and they end up in a stable. And baby Jesus is born and the three shepherds come to pay their respects to the new baby and the three wise men come and they bring gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And then Mary and Joseph go back to Galilee where they lived. And they lived a very modest life because they didn't have very much. And Mary and Joseph, and Joseph was just a humble carpenter. And John's hand goes up. And the teacher said, yes, John. And he says, teacher, you said that Mary and Joseph had nothing and they lived a very modest life. What did they do with the gold that the three wise men brought? <laughs> <laughs> and... Mrs. Toomey said, John, I've been reading this story for 33 years <laughs> and nobody has ever asked me this question. <laughs> and the honest answer is, I don't know. And when I heard that, I thought, wow. I said, there is journalism in one question. <laughs> That's what you do. You ask the obvious question. 
You might look like an idiot. People might laugh at you. But if it doesn't make sense to you, don't just sit there silently accepting. And I, I went up, we, we lived in a little rural part of Ireland in Westmeath, and I went up to my neighbours, um, Jean Kilmartin, and I'd completely forgotten this. She said a week after John's funeral, we were in our kitchen, and you, you told me the story about what Mrs Toomey had told you, and you said that from that day forward, you were going to have that as the mantra of your journalistic life, that you were always going to ask that question. And I do feel that, that I kind of owed it to John and his memory to be that kind of journalist. So when I turned up at the 99 Tour de France, there's Michelle Smith is there, the, the Festina scandal is there, but there's also that little lesson I'd learned from John about asking the obvious question. So when Armstrong suddenly transformed himself into this utterly dominant cyclist, I am the guy who's saying, wow, this is gonna take a lot of explaining. So Lance, what do you say about doping, we said. And Lance said, well, there was a number of journalists around him. He said, you journalists need to understand one thing. First, he said, I'm just going to address this question once, and I will never address it again. And the second thing is, you guys have to accept that the story has changed now. He said, cycling is no longer like it was in the past. It's all changed. And what you need to do as a group, you journalists, is fall in love with cycling again because it's a great sport with great champions. And I'm there saying, Lance, this doesn't convince me that all you guys are clean again. And I was skeptical from day one on that tour. And by the time Sestriere happened, which was like 10 days into the race, I'm completely disbelieving. I had no evidence, but a deep gut instinct. But by the time the tour ends, which is you know three weeks, last day of the tour, I write a line in the Sunday Times that says, there are times when you should applaud the champion. There are other times when you'd be better keep your hands by your sides. And today is a day to keep your arms by your sides because 27-year-old Texan will ride, it, ride down the Champs-Élysées in the yellow jersey. What we need is not acclamation for a new champion, but an inquiry. And that unleashed an unbelievable hell. It did, because the other aspect of all of that you write about is the omerta, as you call it, within cycling, within the peloton, but within the culture of cycling as well, that you, you'd sort of like stood outside the tent and pissed in, so to speak. Yes. Uh, and that was very powerful, and, and it damaged a lot of people. And Christophe Bassoon, who has written his own book about his experience, was one of those brave enough within that peloton to, to speak out. Yeah. But explain to people how that culture worked, that culture of of threat and intimidation and rewarding those supplicants who would actually go along oh, with the story. I, I mean, it was staggering. I mean, the mafia couldn't have worked or murder better than cycling worked it. it honestly, I, I, I'm not saying that as a joke. It, it, I mean, Christophe Basson was this kind of young French guy. He was, I don't know, well, he was around the same age as Lance Armstrong, actually. And physiologically, he was like Armstrong's twin. They had the same build. They had the same kind of um, physiological capacities. Their VO2 max... <laughs> I mean, Armstrong's was 82, 83, Basson's was 83, 84. They were both, you know, very good athletes. Basson maybe slightly better. Um, Basson couldn't compete in the Tour de France. His nickname in the peloton was Monsieur Proper, as in the French for Mr. Clean. And that was like a sarcastic nickname. And the peloton didn't like Basson because he was always talking about doping in the newspapers. He was always saying, that he didn't believe this sport had changed. And the French newspaper, Le Parisien, asked him to do a column during that Tour de France. And in his second column for Le Parisien, he wrote, I don't believe that you can finish in the top 10 in this race clean. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, you have a choice now to make here if you're a if you're, if you're in touch with this race, you can believe Christophe Basson, who says it's still dirty. You can believe Lance Armstrong, who says it's clean. Basson was definitely the more credible character. But once he got in that peloton to, to ride the race, he's getting all kinds of bullying. They're telling him he shouldn't be doing it. They're telling him all this talk is bad for cycling. It's bad for the tour. It's bad for the sport. It's bad for our sponsors, they're telling him. And then when he makes an attack, they immediately close him down. So he can't do anything in the race. And he's, he continues to talk. So then when any of his teammates make an attack, 
everybody neutralizes them. So his team can achieve nothing. And then his team turn against him. And at that point, he's, phys he's psychologically broken down. And even though he's physically fine, he abandons the race, bullied into submission. And the person who bullied him most was Lance Armstrong. Like one day, Basson made an attack. And Armstrong's teammate said, Basson's gone. We, we'll go after him. And Armstrong said, no, L leave him to me. And Armstrong took off and rode up behind him. And Armstrong says, what are you doing? And Basson said, what do you mean what I'm doing? All this talk about doping in the newspapers, it's not good for the sport, Armstrong said. Basson said, it's what I believe and I'm gonna continue saying it. And Armstrong said, well, if that's what you believe, you can fuck off home. And Basson said, well, fuck you too. And it ended, but Basson was kind of brutally beaten into surrender, uh, surrendering. And it was all psychological stuff, and it was incredibly powerful. Everybody was against him. And it also happened to you, though, didn't it? I mean, you were uh, subject to a similar sort of uh, a bullying and uh, a culture of intimidation within the press gallery. Uh, and it, it, was it a case that you uh, were also approached by Lance's lawyer and let know that there was reward for, for being compliant and there was, there was hell the other way. Yeah, I mean, I would never say I was bullied because I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a timid character. I really can stand up for really? myself. Really? You wouldn't pick that yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there was different phases to it. I mean, in, in 2000, it was already known that I was writing bad stuff about Lance, asking lots of questions in the Sunday <laughs> Times. And Bill Stapleton, his lawyer, kind of sidled up to me in the press room before the start of the, of this, 2000 tour, which was going to be Lance's second. And Bill at the time was on the Ethics Committee of the United States, anti uh, United States Olympic uh, Committee, USOC. And Bill comes up to me, good looking guy, young guy, kind of progressive, well-dressed. And he said, David, uh, Lance and I have been reading what you've been writing in the Sunday Times. And I said, I said, have you? And I actually, uh, shamefully, I didn't I didn't recognize him at the time. I didn't know who he was, but as he spoke, it began to fit into place. And he said, yeah, he said, um, we we'll have to admit we're not impressed. And I said, well, I can't, um, I can't help you, you know, with that. He said, look, he said, if you were to write, take a different approach, write different stuff, he said, there could be a lot of access to Lance. And I said, well, you know, that kind of deal, I'm just not interested in doing that. He said, well, if you continue writing what you've been writing, he said, you know, we'll be responding in some way. And I kind of now realized who he was because he's a lawyer and he's Bill Stapleton. And I say, I'm trying to seem really tough. And I say, Bill, is, is that a threat? And I thought that would kind of scare him. And he said, damn right, it's a threat. <laughs> and then I'm scared. <laughs> And uh, that's how it was, you know, then. And then, you know, anybody who traveled with me was bad news, you know, Lance, you know, you only had to be associated with me. How did you feel about that, though, at being uh, made it feel like a pariah just yeah. for doing your job properly? Well, I kind of understood it. You know, I was trying to wreck what was an incredible gravy train that was delivering an awful lot of money to a, 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 a big group of people. <laughs> And I was threatening that. Lance Armstrong was on his way to becoming an iconic figure in the world. I mean, I saw an interview recently in the Washington Post where Lance said he never knew what he was going to do after cycling. He knew. And I'm telling you, it's, it's momentous that we're here on this day, that we're here, because Lance saw himself as a politician. He saw himself having a shot at the presidency of the US. Down the road, I'm telling you, if you think that's outrageous, look who we've got. <laughs> You know, uh, and that's where he saw himself. He saw himself going into politics. And anybody raising questions in the way that I was, you weren't just threatening his image as a fantastic bike racer, you were threatening his future career. So, you know, there's a, 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 an Australian guy that I traveled with on the tour, Rupert Guinness, for many years. And one night, we were, Rupert and I were driving back from um, some stage, it might have been 2002 or 2003. And Rupert wanted to go into um, a hotel, but it was, I think it was Sean O'Grady, might have been still, um, Stuart O'Grady, Stuart O'Grady yeah. might have been still riding in the race, and he wanted to go and see Stuart O'Grady. And um, he went into the hotel, and the US Postal was staying there. And um, Johan Bernil, who was the director of Sportif, saw Rupert, and he kind of, 
followed him, and they're in a corridor, and Johan pinned Rupert against a wall, basically stood him up with his finger pointing, and said, you were fucking with Walsh today at that press conference. We saw you sitting beside him. You know, don't think you can come in here and talk to any of our writers if you're going to associate with him. And he was like incredibly aggressive. And Rupert is the mildest mannered guy you've ever met. And Rupert got really annoyed. And Rupert said, look, David's out in the car. Come on, go out, come out here and you tell him this, you tell him this. And, and Bernigo said, no, no, I don't want to speak to him, but I'm telling you, you associate with him, you're dead to us. You will never get any of our writers to speak to you. And that's the kind of intimidation that was going on. I wouldn't call it bullying. I mean, they, they would have said, they, they would have felt they were just protecting their, their interests. And that kind of stuff worked with a lot of journalists because a lot of journalists couldn't afford not to be speaking and have access to the US postal team. Uh, you had some incredibly brave people that, in the end, helped you make the stories that you wrote in the book *L.A. Confidential*, which you published in in, in French, uh, and, and it built the basis for for the case that eventually came against Armstrong. I want to talk to you about a few of those uh, tonight yeah. as well. Um, certainly, Betsy and Frankie Andreu are, are central to that because they were in the room when Lance was being treated for cancer, and he was openly admitting to his doctors at the time about everything that he'd taken all the performance enhancing drugs he'd taken. Uh, and uh, Betsy was prepared to witness that eventually, but uh, it came at enormous cost to her. Tell us, tell us about Betsy and Frankie and, and uh, the journey that they've been on all this time with you, because it's almost like the, the, you've been in this together. In yes, um, very much so. I mean, Betsy would be, in, in terms of, you know, do I have any heroes from all that time? Well, Betsy would be the number one hero. She was utterly and completely extraordinary in terms of her devotion to the truth. And Frankie was good, he was supportive of her, he never stopped her, but Frankie would never have done this. He would never have gone down the route he went unless Betsy had been driving him. Because for those who don't know, Frankie was one of Lance's old teammates and yes. had been, been a professional That's right, himself. yeah, Frankie, Frankie rode with Lance from Lance's first year in, in the peloton, and they were best friends for about six years, and Betsy, fell out with Lance, you know, they, they had some kind of falling out about the way Lance was treating Fran Frankie and Betsy made her complaints and Lance said, how dare your wife speak to me like this? And, um, and then Betsy, when Lance got cancer, Betsy and Frankie went to see him in Indiana University Hospital and when they were in the room, two doctors come in, they're in a consulting room, not a, not a bedroom. And Betsy says, Lance, you know, said to Frankie, come on, you and I will leave. It was six other people in the, well, four other people in the room, six in all. And Lance said, no, no, no need to, no need to move, leave. And famously then the doctor said to Lance, have you ever used performance enhancing drugs before your cancer? And Lance says, yeah, and he named them, you know, EPO, um, cortisone, uh, testosterone, human growth hormone, and anabolic steroids. And Betsy's listening to this, and she's thinking, this is like end of October, 1996, and she and Frankie are getting married on December 31st, New Year's Eve, two months later, and Betsy is thinking, I'm not marrying this guy if he's doing the same as Lance. So she says to Frankie, come on, you, you and me outside. So they go outside in the corridor, and Betsy said, are you doing the same shit that he's doing? And Frankie said, no, no, I'm not. He lied, basically, because he was, to basically protect his relationship. And when Betsy was horrified by what she'd heard Lance say, and when she went back to, to Detroit, Dearborn, Detroit, where they lived, she told her four best friends what she'd heard. She went to her local GP, her doctor, and said, look, this is what I've heard, and uh, I want you to know. So when I was doing the investigations, and Betsy kind of came, came to me as a potential witness against Lance, she said, talk to my four friends, talk to the doctor. I told them all at the time. Her story was 100% true. Lance has still never admitted that that admission took place. And the reason he will never admit that he made that admission, because what does it matter now? He's admitted everything else. He's admitted that he doped before his cancer. It's like there's nothing to be lost, you would have thought, by admitting, except. And this will give you a sense of the corruption. And it's actually interesting. And you're going to say this might be, this is a far-fetched connection. But, but when you think of, Hillary Clinton been beaten by Trump and how it could happen. I've always felt 
And I think the evidence points overwhelmingly to this. And please, if there's anybody here on social media or working for, don't mention this in print because you'll get sued by the doctor and you mightn't win. Um, but a doctor, a high up oncologist in the University of Indiana University Hospital, Craig Nichols, he gave an affidavit in a case that Armstrong was being sued by his, by the guys who were paying him the bonuses, who didn't want to pay him the bonus because he was cheating. Armstrong got an affidavit that basically said that hospital admission that Betsy Andrea referred to could never have taken place. Craig Nichols was the head oncologist in that hospital. He's the guy who would have known. He said, he didn't say it didn't take place. He basically said in the affidavit, I saw all the medical reports. If it had been admitted, it would have been in the medical reports. Two days after that affidavit was done, the Livestrong Foundation made a $1.5 million donation to that hospital. And that's where the affidavit came from. It was basically bought for 1.5 million donation given by a so-called charity. And like that's the kind of corruption that protected Lance. But Betsy, you asked me a long-winded answer. Betsy was the kind of, um, you've no idea how committed she was to the story. I've often referred to her as the sports editor from hell. <laughs> you know, I would get a phone call from Betsy and she'd say, have you seen that piece in the Seattle Times? And I'd say, Betsy, in Cambridge, the Seattle Times isn't a big seller. <laughs> and she'd say, it's on the internet. Oh, she says, yeah, there's a stuff in there about Lance. You should see it. So I get on the case. And she'd ring me every single day and sometimes twice, three times a day. You know, what have you done? How have you progressed the story? What have you found out? What was driving her? Why were, I mean, because at, at a certain point in most people's lives, you might go, oh, this is too hard, and I've given my entire life to this, and I need to get on with things and accept that this is not going to happen. So what kept... Is this she just couldn't let it go. Force, she couldn't let it go. She, her attitude was, why should we let the cheat win? You know, she just wouldn't let it go. And I mean, she was inspirational in my eyes, because my attitude was... I'm being paid to do this. Yeah. She's not being paid. She's probably paying a price. Oh, you're, you're totally paying a price. She said, she, she said I, on the day that Armstrong went down, 22nd of October, 2012, I rang Betsy and we were talking to her and I said, how do you feel? And she said, you know, I felt anticlimactic. She felt anticlimactic. And uh, she said, but you know what? She said, now I can leave my house and I know when people look at me, they can't say anymore, there she goes, the fucking bitch who lied about Lance. She said, they can't say that anymore. And that's a big thing for me. It would be, yeah. The other, on the other side of that, did you get a sense from your experience about someone like Michelle Ferrari? Um, someone who's obviously driven by their own talents and, and, the, and the power of science, but with a perverted moral perspective on what yeah. they do? Well, not only yeah, a perverted moral perspective. I mean, people who love to beat the system by yeah. cheating. There are people out there who the victory is even better if you've screwed the system. And Ferrari is one of those? And Ferrari is one of those, I believe. You know, wanted to, you know, the doctors who ran the anti-doping, I'm cleverer than you because I can cheat and you'll never catch me. And it's better if I do it like that than if I could do it clean. It's like they want to screw the they system. They want to be the smartest guy in the room. Absolutely. And morals do not come into it. But in relation, just one thing about, I mean, Betsy was a brilliant source for me. So was Emma O'Reilly. So was Stephen Swart. They're the three people that will always be up there right on the top for me because they put themselves out on a limb to t tell the truth. And they were, they, were, they were like fantastically brave. And if you give me a little bit of credit, you've got to give, the, give them this much credit because the bottom line is I was being paid to do it. They weren't. They were just suffering for doing it. And I was a journalist on a crusade that I actually was, I was loving every moment of it. So Emma O'Reilly, tell people about her journey because she worked directly with Lance. Yeah. She was, uh, and, and Emma was amazing because- so The masseuse she was- She the, was, yeah, she was masseuse and she was like personal masseuse to Lance in 99. So when Lance won the tour in 99, um, Lance asked Emma and uh, his mechanic, Julian De Vries, to come around to his hotel room. And uh, they went up to his room and Lance was there and w with his wife and Lance opened the door and he said, look, I just want to give you a gift. And he gave them both lovely Rolex watches that he'd gone out and bought on the Champs-Élysées somewhere in France. Fantastic, two fantastic watches. That's how much he thought of Emma. 
Now, Emma was in the team for five years. Uh, two of those years, she was Lance's personal masseuse. She saw the doping, A to Z, saw everything that went on. And in 2003, she got in touch with a, a journalist in England. And this is where my, this is where good luck came into it. The journalist in England knew that Emma O'Reilly, who had been personal masseuse to Lance, five years in the US postal team, wanted to talk. He didn't want to do the interview. He didn't want to pay the price for doing the interview. Exactly. In other words, he does the interview, <coughs> Lance gets pissed off, he loses access. So he says, oh, there's a guy out there, David Walsh, he'll do the interview. <laughs> and would I what? She lived in, um, Emma lived just outside Liverpool, which is about 200 miles away. I would have walked on broken glass all that journey to have interviewed Emma. Now, I should say, I had an advantage over lots of the other journalists in that I worked for, just for a Sunday newspaper. I didn't need access to Lance as much as guys who were writing for a daily newspaper or guys working for news agencies who, who would have felt they needed access. I didn't need it, so it was easier for me. But I went and interviewed Emma. I interviewed her for seven hours. Talk about chapter and verse. I mean, this is a woman who went to Spain and collected drugs for Lance. This is a woman who put concealer on his arms to hide the syringe marks. This is a woman who dumped his who dumped his uh, used syringes after the stage of the Tour of Holland. This is a woman who was in the room in the night in the 99 Tour, Lance's first, when he had tested positive for cortisone. And she was in the room when they concocted an alibi and decided to backdate a medical prescription to make it look that Lance was legally entitled to use this drug. So she saw all of that. I mean, when that interchange was over between Lance and two team bosses, where they were going to fabricate this medical prescription, Lance turned to Emma and said, now Emma, you know enough to bring me down. She kept a diary at the time, contemporaneous notes, always valuable. She went back to her room that night and wrote in her diary, now Emma, you know enough to bring me down. And she showed me that diary. And so what made Emma want to testify? <laughs> she basically got pissed off with Johan Bernil, who treated her really badly. Which is Lance, Lance's 2IC. Lance's the boss, yeah, boss, director yeah. sportif, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Emma was out of the team two years, and she said, you know, we've had Marco Pantani, the Italian cyclist, who's died at the age of 32. We have other cyclists dying, and nobody seems to care. The doping is going on. I'm fed up of it. I'm going to tell people what's going on. And I was a beneficiary of, of Emma's honesty. She's written her own book and she, she's had a go at you in it too. Yeah, yeah, very much Did so. Did you feel disappointed about that? She said she felt that you threw her under the bus after, yeah. after the revelations that she was very exposed because she would have been seen to have been a participant and a, a co-conspirator in that doping as much as anything else, even though she was a whistleblower. Yeah, she was. And, and, and when, the, when Lance then sued us all, Emma was kind of involved in the lawsuits and she was getting legal threats um, from Lance. And... When the story broke, um, when it all, when the kind of shit hit the fan, I was working at the European Football Championships in, in, in Portugal. And then, and I was getting calls from journalists like all day, every day. And Emma was feeling under siege at home in Liverpool. Press people, you know, coming to her door, all that stuff. And I should have been ringing her and saying, look, are you okay? Are things good? But I wasn't. I wasn't. It was, I was wrong. And, and I got kind of sidetracked by all the stuff I was having to field. And Emma felt I, I kind of let her down. And I think that's fair enough. It's, it's justified criticism. I had no problem with it. And I still think, think the world of Emma, she reconciled with Lance. I think she always liked Lance. There was always um, a kind of, um, a, you know, a, a good relationship between them. She wasn't getting back at him when she was telling me all the secrets. She was getting back at, at the sport of cycling and at Johan Bernil, the, the, the director sportif who treated her badly. But it was incredibly stupid of Lance to let Emma leave the team disgruntled, knowing she knew all the secrets. I mean, that always had the potential to backfire, and it did. There are so many other characters we could talk about. The one that I love, in a way, A, because Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman played him in the film, and it, you know, if you haven't seen the film, uh, uh, David gets played by Chris O'Dowd in the program. But uh, Dustin Hoffman plays Bob Haman, who's the, uh, the guy that eventually calls Lance's bluff uh, yeah. on 
on, uh, on, on the cheating when it comes to paying out the bonuses. And you called him in the book, which I love, the Lionel Messi of bridge. Uh, because that was what he was. He was a bridge player. He's, he, he could, yeah. he's great at uh, doing risk analysis and he could spot bullshit from a million miles away. Tell yeah. me a little about Bob. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I've never played the game of bridge. But I'm told, you know, in Holland, they teach it in secondary schools. Kids are taught to play bridge. And it actually makes total sense to me that they are because the people who've played, and Bob Hammond would be one of these. Bob was a 13-time world champion. People would, some people would regard him as the greatest player to have ever played bridge. And, um, and Bob, you know, Bob has had, Bob is a wealthy man himself because he founded his own company, SEA Insurance, and they basically <coughs> insured you against loss in sporting events. So you're having a charity golf day and you decide to give 200,000 for a hole in one. So you go to Bob Hammond's company, how much do we have to pay you to carry that liability? So he assesses all the risk of that happening, the likelihood, and he gives you a price. Lance went to him, or Lance's people went to him and said, we want to pay Lance $10 million in bonuses over the next four years if he wins the tour every year. We want cover for that. Bob gave them cover. And then when Bob read LA Confidential, the book that I brought out um, with Pierre Ballester in 2004, he didn't read it, a fellow called John Bandy, who was a lawyer who worked for Bob and had lived in France for 12 years, fluent French speaker. He reads this book in French and he says, boss, you've been ripped off. This guy Armstrong, complete cheat. And Bob decided, I've got five million left to pay Lance, I'm not paying him. And that started a legal process. And Bob was, he was absolutely brilliant as a strategist, and he, he, but he was, also, he was also a guy who totally believed that cheating wasn't good, and that because he'd had it in bridge, there, he'd, been, he'd competed against an Italian team who had a way of touching their feet under the table to convey what they were doing. And Bob wasn't having cheating, he just thought, totally wrong. So we had this whole process in, in, in Texas in 2006. It went on for four weeks, the, the legal case Bob lost. Not only did he, have to pay the, did he have to pay the five million, but he had to pay an extra 2.5. So instead of paying the five, he paid 7.5. But Bob, there's a brilliant scene in the, in the film where Bob is walking out of the court and Bill Stapleton, the lawyer who threatened me five years before, he comes up alongside Bob, and Bob turns in, in the film, Dustin Hoffman, stretches out his hand and said, he said, well done, uh, Bill, you know, you're by one today. And Bill Stapleton says, Bob, it's, it's nice of you to be so gracious about it. And, Bill's, and Bob Hammond said, no problem, Bill. He said, but one thing I would say to you, he said, lying under oath, it's not the same as telling little white lies to journalists. And I thought that was so true because this would come back to, ha to haunt Armstrong. Every time you see a clip of Lance lying under oath, it's in the Bob Hammond process. And of course, once federal authorities in the US got evidence from Floyd Landis and others that Lance was a doper, they know there's this legal process in Texas where Lance has put his hand on a Bible and said, I never doped. And then all this evidence comes out that he did dope. So of course, the authorities are all over it. But Bob Hammond, you're right to kind of pick him out um, because he's a fantastic character. And I, I kind of, I loved, I mean, Bob, Bob, Bob told me, and I, I don't know if any of you play bridge, but Bob said to me, he said, all my life, I've had rich guys come to me, really rich guys, and say, I'll give you five million to go and play poker. You don't have to put in a, up a penny. We'll put up the five million. Any profits you make, we split 50-50. And I said, Bob, easiest thing in the world. Why wouldn't you do it? And he said, if you've played bridge, you could never play poker. <laughs> you know, you just couldn't do it. He said, it's like so mind-numbingly boring. <laughs> <laughs> and bridge is such a challenge. You know, and I just thought, you know, the money didn't interest him. But, you know, in the end, Lance had to pay Bob Hammond back 12 million. So Bob got all his money back in time. And that's, a, and that's the wonderful part. That's what kind of restores your faith in humanity, that Bob, in the end, all he did was get his money back because he spent about 12 million, but he got it back. When Lance finally had to come clean because he was forced to, how did it make you feel? 
do this a couple of times. How did you feel watching the Oprah interview? Because we all seen that, and it was a sit down moment. Everyone tuned in to watch. Oh, yeah. How did you feel about that? Because I think reading your book, you felt that uh, this was a, a, actually a play by Lance Armstrong that went horribly yeah. wrong. Tell people oh, why yeah. you feel that. Yeah, I did. I mean, I could see it a mile off. Um, in that, you know, when you're pursuing somebody like I was pursuing Lance, you get a really good sense of what he's like as a person. It's, it's that kind of, you know, um, was it Lieutenant Gerard who was after Richard Kimball in The Fugitive? <laughs> and that years and years, I'm, I'm dating myself now, I'm remembering this. But Gerard would have known what Kimball was like. Kimball would have known what Gerard was like. And um, I felt I knew what Lance was like. And when it came to all this evidence had been amassed by <laughs> United States anti-doping agency, and they put it out there. And it's like 26 witnesses say they saw Lance Armstrong doping or they knew of his doping firsthand. 11 of the 26 were former teammates. So come on, this is overwhelming evidence. Nobody can deny it. So Lance decides, I've got to come clean. Where will I do it? And he decides, well, Oprah Winfrey has been a huge donor to my Livestrong Foundation. I've met her. She's an admirer of mine. She loves a good kind of uh, tell-all confession. And a classic American redemption story. I Absolutely. throw myself at your feet and yeah. you, you raise me up. That's right. And Lance felt that he goes on Oprah, he gives her a world exclusive, he admitting that he doped, he's falling from grace, she'll stretch out her arms and break his fall. And she'll put her arms around him and she will say, there are more important things in life, Lance, than taking drugs, and you've done the more important things. That's how he felt it would go. So he decides to do the interview. And he doesn't realize, because he really hasn't done his research on Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey is, she's been described, and it hasn't been disputed, she's been described as the first black billionaire. Not the first black female billionaire, the first black billionaire. She came from this really difficult family background. She had a child at the age of 15, lost a child, lost a child, and then had appalling things happen in her very early life. She went working for a local radio station as a kind of a morning show person, did brilliantly, and her career then became, went into orbit. And what Lance didn't realize is that this woman is just an outstanding journalist. She might be a big world celebrity, she might be this, she might be that, but basically, the reason she succeeded is she's an, un, uh, like an uncannily brilliant interviewer. And she understands people. And she isn't always easy on people, even though she's empathetic with everybody. Oprah decided, OK, Lance, I'll do the interview. It's set up. And then Oprah gets her people to ring people like me. So a woman called Jenna. Oh, I forget her name, like a Polish name, Kapitnik or something like that, Kapitnik, calls me up and she said, can we speak about Lance Armstrong? And I said, yeah, of course. She introduced herself. She told me I'm senior producer for the Oprah Winfrey show. And uh, she asked me loads of questions about Lance. And I could see she was like top journalist. All her instincts were journalistic. So when I sat down to watch Oprah's interview with Lance, I wanted to see had the stuff because they rang Betsy Andreo, they rang Greg LeMond, and they would have said similar things to what I was saying. <clears throat> so when I watched the interview, I wanted to see, was Oprah, had she, had she taken on board the kind of information I'd given? And she totally had. That is still the best interview. Lance has done tons of interviews since then. Not one of them, not one of the interviews since then, has come near getting as much from him as she got in that very first interview. To me, it's a classic piece of brilliant journalism. And what, what Oprah didn't do is she didn't engage with Lance emotionally. She was quite detached. She was courteous. She asked her questions in a very civil way, but she never really reached out and gave him that emotional connection that would have broken his fall. She, she just didn't do it. And he kind of immediately regretted doing that interview. He, st he started then denying what he had said on Oprah. Like she said to him at one point in the interview, were you a bully? And she asked it in a way that said, 
we both know the answer to this, Lance, so don't, <laughs> don't mess around with me. He said, yeah, yes, I was a bully. And then two weeks later, he did an interview with Texas Monthly, a magazine in Dallas Space Magazine. And he said, by the way, I just want to say, I said on Oprah Winfrey I was a bully. I was wrong. I'm not <laughs> a bully. <laughs> and of course, the cat was out of the bag in a way. But that was a, to me, that was a, a, a terrific interview and reflected incredibly well in Oprah Winfrey. Give you a sense of satisfaction? Yeah, a bit. I mean, it was very flattering because she said to him towards the end of the interview, would you apologize to... Well, Lance said he would apologize to this person, this person, this person, this person. And Oprah said, I know somebody you won't apologize to. And she said, would you apologize to David Walsh? And he kind of goes back in his chair and says, oh, he says, that's a good question. And she said, who's pursued you for 13 years, who wrote articles in the Times, who wrote books, will you apologize to him? And again, he realized he was under pressure. He said, he said yeah. He said, I would apologize to David. Has he? Not to hope in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Are you too. joking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he, he's, but we'll, take, we'll go to the floor and take some questions. Man. But he's still obsessed with you. And I found this out firsthand. I don't know if you know this. So when we f finally got David to, uh, to agree to a time and place to come out here, I sent a tweet out that just said, um, you know, Great news for the Sports Writers Festival at David Walsh, coming in November. The man who uh, exposed and, and helped bring down Lance Armstrong, coming to us at Lance Armstrong, coming to Australia. And within minutes, he texted, he tw tweeted back saying, oh, you mean Jeff Nowitzki? He was, you know, he was being facetious. He was talking yeah. about the USA the drug agency agent who uh, ran the case against him that forced him into a corner. Yeah. But it was like he had this radar that he knew, as soon as I mentioned your name, yeah. he was on top of us. Yeah. He was right in there. It yeah. was extraordinary. It's a funny thing, you know, because Lance has said in a number of interviews when he's trying to seem reasonable, he says, well, you know, David and I are quite similar people. And How I does think, that make you feel when he makes that kind <laughs> I say, honestly, I say, Lance, I know what you mean, but there are some differences. <laughs> and, and um, you know, what he means is we, we both kind of played to win. I wasn't going to give up until I got him. He wasn't going to give up until he ground me into the ground. And I see that and I get that. Uh, I wasn't going to quit. He wouldn't regard himself as a quitter. In that way, we would have similar characteristics. And he would say that I would, I would have done anything to bring him down. And I would say, yes, I would, but I wouldn't have lied, which he would, he would, he would argue that I would have lied. I, I would say, Lance, I definitely wouldn't. But... When he says that, he kind of forgets that he was perjuring himself, he was breaking the law, he was doing, he was doing things that really should have had him in prison. And, um, and I don't think I was doing anything that would have had me in prison. He's now, and just, just to, f to finish that story, I did invite him to come to the Sports Writers Festival via Twitter saying, hey, I know you've written books. Fiction, true, but they're still books. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get an answer to that one. Um, He's now undergoing a, a charm offensive of sorts. He's got a, a new podcast, which all sorts of um, highfalutin people turn up and are happy to sit down and talk to him on. It's called The Ford, if you want to check it out. Occasionally, you do pop up in conversation in, that, in this thing, I'm sure you're aware. Um, at what point do we forgive or do we allow Lance Armstrong to re-enter polite society and, and get on with the rest of his life? Um, or do we just... Well, uh, I, I would I'd like to see him get on with the rest of his life, um, but I think he kind of... I think he owes it to people to get on with the rest of his life in a, you know, do whatever you're going to do, Lance, but make it relatively speaking low profile because you've lost your right to be an advocate for any causes. You've lost your right to kind of um, try to gain the public's trust. You know, you, you had that and you completely abused it. So you really, I wouldn't be comfortable seeing him back on that stage as an advocate. He wants anything. to be there though. Oh, totally. Totally. He, w he won't be happy with a normal, low-profile life. That won't do it for Lance. He's got to be back there. The, the thing that I imagine he's most struggling with now is the sense that he's become irrelevant. I mean, in the US, there's just very little interest in the, in the brand of Lance, Mar of Lance Armstrong. In Europe, it's different. You know, if he shows up in Europe, journalists are still really keen to interview him. There's lots of people who will give him time and coverage. But it's not like that in the US. And, and I think there's a reason for that, in that we felt outraged by his behavior. Americans felt betrayed. And the sense of betrayal is harder to get over than the sense of outrage. What happened to all those Livestrong bracelets? Yeah. Where have they all gone? They've disappeared. How many did they sell? 80 million. 
And that was a dollar a time that Nike were putting into his foundation. So every, every Livestrong wristband was, was a dollar, and there was 80 million of them. And um, when, I was, when I was like a bit obsessed by the story, I'd be going to America to cover the masters in golf for the Sunday Times. And I'd be in a queue, you know, at X-ray machine. And the guy in front of me, or four places in front of me, would have a Livestrong band. Guy dressed in a suit, briefcase, kind of very kind of corporate looking guy. And I'd sidle up to him, I'd say, excuse me, I just wanted to speak to my friend. And the friend is a person I've never seen in my life until five seconds before. <laughs> and I'd say to the guy, I said, look, I, I don't want to, you know, you know, be rude or anything like that, but you're wearing the Lance Armstrong wristband. And the guy would say, yeah, so what? And I'd say, the guy's a complete fraud. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> and the guy would look at me like I was some kind of alien or who I'd, or who I'd called his wife a whore, you know, it's like... <laughs> He, you know, he just had a look that said, please go away. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. And they didn't. They never wanted to hear. Nobody ever said, what makes you say that? They just heard a kind of a European accent, uh, English or Irish or wherever you're from, don't want to know. And, uh, but I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> there are still people who don't want to know. I mean, we have people on our Facebook page going, oh, David Walsh, he's only in it for the money. He wrote the book to, to write on the back of Lance's fame. Uh, there was 188 other writers in the peloton, but I only went after Lance. He was yeah. determined to bring him down. They were all cheating, so it's okay. Why, why, why couldn't Lance Armstrong just be the best of the cheaters? How do you respond to that sort of pretzel logic when it comes to... Uh, to, to explain why it mattered that, that the pursuit of Lance Armstrong was seen through? Yeah, see, the thing about Lance was he, he wasn't just a cyclist and it wasn't just about the bike. It really wasn't. He, he became a, a global icon because he had recovered from cancer and come back to win the Tour de France. And his book, which was written by Sally Jenkins, a Washington Post journalist, I mean, in terms of a talented writer applying herself to writing a book, it was an extraordinarily well-written book. I mean, Sally Jenkins did a fantastic job on that book and it sold you know millions of copies and it's the kind of book that for years you heard that your granddad or your uncle or your aunt or your grandmom had been told that he or she had terminal cancer well one of the things a lot of people did was they went out and bought Lance's book and they gave it to their sick relative or sick grandfather and said read this book it's inspirational and they read the book and they found it completely inspirational. And if you consider that that book was founded on, a, on an unbelievably cynical lie and the place that it had in people's kind of lives, I just thought that was an obscenity beyond belief. And the treatment of all those people, I mean, there's a thing on YouTube, you can still see it. Lance is up on a stage like this and there's a crowd similar to this crowd and they're all cancer survivors or cancer victims, cancer sufferers. And Lance has been asked a question about doping by the, by the person playing Francis' role. And Lance says, yeah, people say I would take drugs. You guys, you've been through, going through what I've been through. Am I gonna to go to a doc now and say, doc, I wanna win a bike race, give me what you got? Am I gonna do that? And all the people in the crowd are saying, no, of course not, Lance. Yeah, it's ridiculous, this accusation that I would take drugs. You guys know what we've all been through here. And you look at that and you think, how much cynicism did it take to stand before those people and express that lie? And then people say to me, but why did you pick on Lance? Like, it's perfectly obvious. He wasn't any other cyclist. He won the race seven times. He accumulated over $200 million in earnings from this, precisely because he wasn't like any other cyclist. Any other cyclist winning the Tour de France is, is earning a million, two million extra. Lance was earning 50 million, 100 million extra. So he was a completely different case. And I never had any doubts that going after him in a, in a particular individual way was utterly justified because he wasn't like all the others. And his story certainly isn't. 
We've got time for some questions, so if you uh, put your paw in the air, they've got some people at the back too who might want to ask some questions. We'll get to as many of you as possible in the next uh, 25 half minutes, half an hour. Just stand up and, and say your name and, and fire away. G'day, David. Um, a lot of us grew up on the voice of Phil Liggett, um, and for the whole time Lance was writing, even when sort of the story became fairly evident that he was probably doping, Phil Liggett was his biggest supporter. I, I was interested to know your relationship with, with Phil and uh, your thoughts on the way he covered it um, and how he's handled it since. Yeah, um, when the movie came out, <coughs> the people in the promoting the movie invited Phil to a screening in London and I met him and we had this ridiculously false conversation where I didn't want to be rude and he didn't want to be anything other than polite and he, and he was saying, you know, he'd just seen the movie, I love the movie, it's great, blah, blah, blah. When this was going on, if I'd met you at the time, 2004, you were at the Tour de France and we were having a coffee and you'd said to me, is there anybody that you really dislike in terms of the way they've covered this? I would have said, two people stand above all the others, Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. <laughs> I hated them with a passion you wouldn't believe. Nothing, there was nothing that anybody did that I felt came close to the cynicism of what those two guys did. Because they were very important, they were forming your, your views on this. You know, there's a piece of commentary where Paul Sherwin says, you know, I think it was used in that really good documentary, Stop at Nothing, was made by Australian Broadcasting Corporation, um, which was a really good documentary. Paul Sherwin is saying, there are people who say this guy dopes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, what he's got is great inner strength, great this, great that. They knew that Lance was doping. And they kind of willfully, you know, told their viewers exactly the opposite. And I just found that incredibly hard. At the time, I couldn't bear to, on those Tour de France's, I'd see Paul Sherwin coming down the road and I'd be going up. I just couldn't look at the guy. Same for Phil Liggett. I just didn't want to have anything to do with them because I thought they were in really powerful positions and they were abusing it. Uh, could you talk about Greg LeMond and who was, I think, one of the early <coughs> people who uh, said that Lance could have only done what he did if he was doping and the effect it had on his life and his business? Oh, yeah. I mean, Greg was another source of mine. I mean, he didn't have any direct knowledge of Lance's doping, but he had conversations with Lance that he told me about where Lance was famously once said to him, come on, Greg, we all dope. You know what I mean? What's the big deal? And Greg is saying, I didn't dope. Come on, Lance is saying, you took EPO like the rest of us. And Greg is saying, I didn't take EPO. And and that was a really interesting allegation by Lance because you had to say, hold on now, is it possible that Greg did take EPO? Well, Greg retired in 1993 because he couldn't compete. That was the year that everybody thinks EPO became, its use became widespread within the peloton. And Greg's argument was, suddenly everybody was going so fast, I couldn't keep up anymore, and he, and he retired immediately. And you're right to allude to how Greg suffered because Greg had a cycling company that was very successful. And basically, I know Lance has denied this recently, but it's absolutely true. Lance, through his influence with Trek, got Trek to close down Greg's, Greg's business. And Greg went through an absolutely traumatic time. He lost a huge amount um, because of the pressure, the commercial pressure that Lance was able to put on him. And uh, Greg went through a really horrific time. I mean, Lance called him a, uh, an alcoholic. He called him a drug addict, you know, I mean, when Lance decided he was going to kind of go after you and bring you down and, and tarnish your reputation, he, there was no depths to which he wouldn't plunge. And then he would go deeper again. I mean, it was, it was really brutal what he did to Greg. But Greg has been vindicated now. He's the only American winner of the Tour de France. And that's a big thing to be able to claim. Yeah, I've got some... Sorry, there's a, someone... We'll come to him. Yep. Uh, so... Some would say that, uh, you know, for Lance, giving hope to, to millions and if everyone was cheating and he's raising that much money that no one else could, uh, it's all for the best, you know? It's given a lot of people hope. It's raised a lot of money. He'd go back and he'd probably do it all again. Um, 
could that be justification for his lies and in his own mind that you think is psychopathical or sociopathical? Like, do you think that maybe he feels it's justified because of the amount of money that he's raised, the amount of hope that he's given? And do you think that could have been why he continued to, to lie and feel like he wasn't doing anything wrong? Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it like that, but I'm sure you're right. And it's, um, you know, it's an intelligent way of looking at it. You know, Lance decided, okay, I am telling lies here, but look at the greater good. See the bigger picture. And I'm sure that that's how Lance may well have seen it. Uh, lots of people at the time said, I don't care if he's taking performance enhancing drugs. Look at the money his foundation is raising. And my argument used to be, well, what happens if the foundation actually has been created as a shield that protects him from scrutiny? Well, then you have to look at it in a different way. And I used to quote um, Al Capone, um, the gangster in Chicago, 1920s. Yeah, there are many examples. I mean, uh, Pablo Escobar in, in Medellin in the yes. 1990s with, with uh, the city of Medellin, he, built, he basically housed and fed tens of thousands of people while yeah. at the same time running his drug company. That's right. I mean, there's a, a, a fantastic story in the Chicago Tribune. You can get it online. It's a brilliant photograph on Thanksgiving Day, 1930, in Chicago. You have this line of people, like, I'd say, 200 yards long, six wide, maybe about 1,000 people. Well, they're all queuing up there. They're kind of down and out of Chicago. And they're all queuing up to go into Al's soup, soup kitchen, Al Capone's soup kitchen. He's giving them soup and a full meal on Thanksgiving Day. And he fed 5,000 people on that day who wouldn't otherwise have had a proper meal. And the Chicago Tribune reporter interviewed people in the line. And one of the guys in the line said, Al Capone has done more for this city than the federal government has done for the last 100 years. And you know, that's how people felt about Al Capone. It didn't mean he wasn't murdering people, but it meant that the soup kitchens gave people a different impression of what he was really about. And gave him a moral license to do. And gave him a moral license yeah. to do appalling things. So the answer to your question basically is, you no, know, it can't justify it. And, and, and on a, a really simple level, everybody faces this question, which would you rather, a beautiful lie or an ugly truth? And I've always been a believer in I'd rather the ugly tr truth. We'll come down the back. Thank you both for a wonderful discussion so far. Um, two quick questions. On that, um, I was just wondering how much grief or flack you got from the whole Live Strong movement or as a result of, you know, what happened with, with the revelations that you, you brought forward. Um, and secondly, on the Michelle Smith thing, has she ever spoken about... Um, what happened, what she went through, and I just wonder what she might be doing now, if you know. Yeah, I do. I know well. I do. Let's take the um, um, first part of your question. Did I get flack from Bab Livestrong? Not really. I was a bit too far away from them. I would have been getting flack from, from journalists. Um, I remember once uh, being approached by a Dutch journalist who said to me, you know, why are you continuing to write about Armstrong? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, like, you know I know. Of course they're cheating. They're pretty much all cheating. We just accept it and get on with it. And I, my attitude is, oh, well, I, that's not the way I'm going to go. I can't accept this and get on with it. But I, that kind of atmosphere I was getting, like I would go to the Tour de France and there was like lines of tables of journalists. And where previously you'd have loads of people to talk to, I'd be walking up and down trying to find one journalist or two journalists who I knew would want to talk to me. And there were very few. I was just a pain in the ass that they didn't want to have to deal with. Um, now, Michelle Smith, it's really interesting what's happened, Michelle. I mean, as I've said to you earlier, she's, she was a, she's a bright young woman. She went after her, her career ended because of a doping ban. She decided to study law. She went on from there to do, uh, became a barrister. And she's now a very successful barrister in Dublin. She's <coughs> never discussed her cycling, uh, cycling career, her swimming career. And I have a a fantasy about Michelle <laughs> in that I'm going to be in a witness box on some pretty serious charge and she's going to be the prosecuting <laughs> barrister and she's going to say to me, Mr. Walsh, can we have the truth? 
and I'll say, I'll tell it if you tell it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question up. Um, my question is more about sports writing, and you've kind of mentioned it in your own comments about when you first came across Sean Kelly, and you've also mentioned it a little bit with uh, Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. But I wonder about the, the kind of compromise and the difficulty that uh, sports writers have as fans and how they actually draw the line between being a journalist and being a fan. And, and can, have you got any particular comments to make about that? And, and it probably comes into, particularly with something like the Tour de France, where it comes across as most of the, the sports writers that cover the Tour de France are actually fans first and then journalists afterwards. Yeah, uh, I think the question you raise is absolutely central to good sports writing in that the best sports writers have to be journalists first, fans second, but, that, but the reason they're sports journalists in most cases is because they were fans. You know, it's like so many journalists I know they got into it because they loved the sport and being a sports writer was a way of working in an area they wanted to work in. And in a way, that's the wrong starting point. I used to say to journalists when I would speak to him, look, your commitment has to be to journalism, not to the sport. You're not here to promote the sport, although great sports writing effectively does, does promote a sport. But it is the, it's the eternal dilemma. What are you? Are you a, are you a fan or, or are you a journalist? And we used to have this expression. We called them FWTs, were the people we looked down on in the press room. And an FWT was a fan with the typewriter. And we, we you know, you know, if, if we're in a press box and, and then somebody scores a goal or does something great in a match and a person in the, in, in the press room cheers, we all look at him like, you know, what are you doing? We're not here as cheerleaders. Um, but going back to your question and the Tour de France, yeah, most of the guys who covered the tour are fans, of, are fans of cycling who've ended up as journalists. And I think that's even more so the case now because so many, there are so many platforms for people to kind of be journalists. And a, a lot of people end up there just because they love the sport. And to me, it's the wrong starting point. And ultimately, it's no good if we're, if we're applauding or acclaiming somebody who's cheated. It's just, it's, that to me is the depressing part. I'll come down here, then we'll come back to the front. I think we've got a question up the back. How are you? Jonathan O'Doherty from Tune County Galway. How are you, David? <laughs> um, absolutely fantastic book, Seven Deadly Sins. Um, top book, not just book. Um, my question is in connection with, maybe a lot of people don't know here, but you went on uh, the Late Late Show um, at around a period of time where you were under a lot of ambush. It's on YouTube, if anybody wants to check. And my question is, throughout all of this, um, particularly in an age where uh, personality tends to tri triumph over character, how you maintain your own dignity and your humility, uh, particularly when you had facts in a lot of cases which would have won arguments, hands down, and you kind of let people um, continue with their own beliefs. Uh, and maintain class right the way along the way. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. It's, you're, you're, you're being extremely generous. Um, but um, The Late Late Show was a big Irish talk show. I mean, the longest running talk show in the world. There were times when the Irish nation, every single person watched it. It was just an unbelievable thing. And to be honest, it was a really big deal, wasn't it? To be oh, it. Huge. And in, uh, I think it was about 2001, I got invited on with Stephen Roach, who was Ireland's only winner of the Tour de France. And we're sitting like, you know, first they said, David, we'll put you in the crowd, we'll talk to Stephen and we'll ask a couple of questions. I'd written an article saying that he was a doper um, based on, based on um, reports that, are, that had come out of Italy. And um, the, the, the kind of interesting part was that I was his official biographer. I'd written two books with Stephen Roach and we were supposedly great friends. But my attitude was, just because we were friends, doesn't mean I close my eyes to the fact that he's, it now turns out he was doping. And uh, so I write the story, and Ireland was outraged as a country. Lots of people believe me, most people didn't. <clears throat> I get invited onto Late Late Show. 
and the, the anchor thinks Stephen Roach is God. And he thinks, like I'm a piece of rubbish on the sole of his foot that he's had to have on a show. And the discussion goes on for, I don't know, more than 20 minutes. And it's on YouTube, and it's really funny because I'm trying to kind of politely say the guy's a doper. Stephen is trying to argue. They go to the crowd, uh, the audience, and of course, there's a guy in the audience who's a doctor who says, I'm a, com I'm a complete charlatan, and Stephen Roach is a hero of his. And then they go to these, this old guy who makes an impassioned kind of statement. And the, the anchor doesn't say, this is Stephen's father. And his mum is there. I think she might have spoken as well, and they... they defend Stephen. And it was quite a difficult kind of 20 minutes for me, however long it went on. But I remember walking out and feeling like a total pariah because I'd been telling the Irish nation that their Tour de France winner was actually a fraud. And I, I, I went to reception and I said, do you know the people who call into the show to give you their opinions? I said, who takes those calls? And she said, we do at this desk. And I said, did you have many calls about my discussion with Stephen. And she said, a huge amount. I said, what constitutes a huge amount? And she said, we had 400, around, just around 400 calls. And I said, how did they divide up between pro and, and contra? And she said, 50-50. About half the people who called thought you were right, and half the people thought he was right. And I remember, I was on a total <laughs> high. No, I just thought 50% believe me, <laughs> which was about 46% more than I expected. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. I believe you were saying before, David, that you went to the Rio Olympics? Yes. I, I might have missed something, but I'm surprised that I've only heard of one person that's been caught doping during the Rio Olympics, which, being a cynic, it can't be true. Yeah, well, it certainly isn't true that only one person was doping at the Rio Olympics, that's for sure. Um, the, testing there, the testing there, we now know, was rubbish. Yeah. You know, um, and Rio was running out of money as the Olympics were happening. I mean, people say to me, did you enjoy, did you enjoy the Olympics? <clears throat> and this is going to sound terrible, given how privileged my position is to be able to go to the Olympics and have somebody else pay. The thing I enjoyed most about my time in Rio was I went and met a journalist, uh, an investigative journalist who worked in Rio, brilliant investigative journalist. He'd been doing stories on the head of the Olympics who'd been corrupt and had been giving big contracts to relatives of his. And because he had done that, of course, Rio wouldn't accredit him to go to the Olympics. And he basically took me into a favela and showed me how this favela had been preserved by a Catholic bishop in this particular suburb that had been gentrified. And there's like 5,000 people living in a, an area about half the size of a soccer pitch. And it's now a really plush, affluent area of um, Rio. And he told me the history of it. And he told me the kind of journalism that he was doing. And I found that the most interesting part of my time. I really didn't like being there. I think it was an obscenity to hold the Olympics in Brazil. All the money they've spent on that all the promises that were made to the, the huge amount, I think it's two million people who live in favelas, like it's a significant number of the Rio population, maybe 25% who live in favelas. They were told that they would get this, they would get that. They got nothing. They have this bay that they were going to clean up because it's horribly polluted. Never happened. What you've got is huge stadia, many of which now will be pretty redundant. New roads built in the area where the stadia were, which was in the area that all the middle class people live. It's just a horrible exercise in making the kind of privileged elite more privileged. And you know, you couldn't have enjoyed the Olympics if you had a social conscience. Never mind a doping conscience. We have a question at the front. Oh, hi David. Hi Francis. Uh, thanks for a wonderful discussion. But I've got a um, a question about journalism. And uh, journalists seemingly becoming I guess more celebrities nowadays, and it's, uh, I suppose, and it's becoming increasingly more about journalists and less about the story and what your take on, what I take on that was, sorry, and uh, how comfortably that sits with you. I know, I guess my take on it is we see it a lot in this town, particularly when we talk about AFL and increasingly about which journalist wrote what and they all talk about who wrote what and, and all that sort of stuff. And I suppose for yourself, um, you've come into, I guess, some sort of celebrity with your, your takedown of 
the king, I suppose, Lance, and, uh, and how, how comfortably that, that sits with you? Yeah, I, I think the point you make is perfectly valid. I, in a general sense, I'm, I'm totally uncomfortable with it, but it's a pretty difficult situation then when, say, for example, you, you've written this book and a film company come along and say, we'd like to adapt your book into a film. What do you do? You say, um, no, because that's going to bring a degree of celebrity. Or do you say, this sounds fun and they're going to pay me more than my newspaper is going to pay me, you know, and I don't have to do anything except take the money. Well, I, I've got seven kids, all of them went to university. <laughs> I had virtually nothing, so of course I say yes and I do it. And a bit of celebrity comes with that, and it comes with a huge danger. And I totally agree that there's far too much I in journalism now, and journalists have become almost as much the story as the story they write. <clears throat> it should be that the story is what matters. And the journalism should be far more important than the journalist. I mean, on the sky thing, I was saying to Francis earlier that I have a dream that I, that I want to realize in the next few weeks where I want to write a story about sky, where I don't mention the fact that I was living inside the team for 13 weeks, where I don't mention any conversations I've had, where I just do a proper journalist job, talk to people, put all the pieces together, tell the story and tell it without any comment and just let the reader decide how he wants to decide. That's the journalism I would most like to do. That's the journalism that is most satisfying. And I think that's the journalism that is most valuable. So the point you're making, I agree 100%. I think we're running out of time. In fact, we're going to get kicked out of here pretty soon. So I just want to ask one last question before we, before we wind up. And that is, given all that you've experienced in sport and, um, and writing about it, can we still believe in sport? Do you still believe in the values that we spoke about earlier on that, uh, that Jamie says drives you know, his company and that in writing about Lance Armstrong and others that you're in a sense trying to uphold and protect? Yeah, I, I believe we can believe in sport. Uh, there's plenty that I believe in and of course there's plenty I'd be suspicious about. But I mean, I watch Usain Bolt and I think, well, athletics has been so tarnished. Can I believe what I'm seeing? And I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt to a degree. I don't know athletics as well as I would know other sports, but I watched the English Premier League football. I covered Man City's game on Saturday against Middlesbrough. Do I think I'm watching doped up footballers? I don't. Do I believe that they might be overdosing on painkillers to overcome injury? Yes, I do. That's legal. Yes, it is. Um, is it unethical? Well, it, it might be a little bit unethical in that they may be overusing painkillers, but I can live with that. I look at something like the Tour de France, and I, I was thinking about this today because I, I covered it last year, and our youngest child, who's 19 year old, came with me on the tour, and she had no interest in cycling. But on the tour for four weeks, she fell in love with it. So she gets to know all of the Chris Froome and Quintana and Contador and Richie Port and all of the guys. And one day in the final week, I'm walking down to the start where the riders sign on and Molly, my 19 year old, is with me. And uh, Richie Port, whom I, I got to know when I was with Team Sky, is coming opposite me in his red BMC jersey. And um, he goes past me. And as he's gone past me, he, rec he remembers kind of who I am. And to give him great credit for being kind of a sweet guy, he turns his bike around and comes back. And he said, oh, David, I hadn't seen you. How are you? And we have a chat. And my 19-year-old daughter looked on this, and she thought it was the most amazing thing she's ever seen in her life. Richie, Richie Port spoke to her dad, right? <laughs> now, thinking about that, if I thought Richie Port was a cheat, I'd be really embarrassed about it. I'd be saying to her, Molly, there's nothing... You know, you shouldn't think that that's anything special. You know, don't think that that's a good thing. But I don't believe Richie Port is a cheat. And I'm kind of happy that he stopped and came back and we had a lovely chat and remembered some old times. Um, so I think what you must never do is decide they're all at it because they're not all at it. Plenty of them are and you have to make up your mind. 
but don't don't allow your skepticism to become cynicism because once it becomes cynicism you end up being unfair to a lot of people who are playing by the rules David, it's been great having you here. After um, uh, all the uh, troubles you had at home and, uh, and the fact that you came out uh, in this brief window of opportunity, we're internally grateful. And uh, we hope to get you back again soon. Thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you. David Walsh, everyone. <laughs> David, um, the Peter Mews from the, the Brunswick Street Bookstore is up there, up the back. He does have copies of David's book. David's happy to sign a few for you if you want to go up there and, uh, and purchase a copy of his book. Thank you for coming along. This is the uh, final event in Melbourne for this year's Sports Writers Festival, but we're already starting to plan for next year. So hopefully we'll see you there again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I probably went on too no, long. No, no, it's great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it went well. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah.